For today's video, we've come to the home of the Riverfest final, Bert and Joyce on the River Trent. Fantastic match length, well, fantastic length for all sorts of fishing. Specimen hunters come here for the barbel. There's a lot of bream and good shoals of uh, roach and dace and big perch as well. So there's something for everybody. As you may be able to see, the river has come up. Um, we've actually had some rain at last, uh, the last couple of days, and I think it's rising. It's quite coloured, it's pushing through. So we've come down, I'm on peg 11 on the roadside, which is a peg I drew in the Riverfest final three years ago on the Sunday, actually in similar conditions. And I caught 20 pound plus of roach that day, fishing 11 metres, just on the crease. So, I don't know, in these conditions, hopefully we'll catch some fish. Could hook a bream, they go big in here, so if I do hook one, it might be a bit of a struggle to get it in, but I've set up two flat floats and a round float, two gram round, two, two gram flat float, and a three gram flat float. We'll have to see what happens to the river. But the good thing about these pegs is, we've got these bushes and trees upstream, and they push the flow, the main flow out a bit. So we've got some steady water. Some of the match length, it will be bombing through at your feet. So these are, these are nice pegs. If the fish feed, we could catch some nice roach. Like I say, maybe a bream. We're gonna fish ground bait with hemp and casters. I've got some worms as well to chop up. And uh, we just have to see what happens. I think it'll be a slow start. I'm not expecting to go in and just start catching. I'm gonna loose feed hemp and casters over the top. Um, and the way this peg plums up, basically there's a bit of a ledge at about 10 metres. The peg sort of comes up and shallows up in this area, sort of from 10 metres closer. So I'm just gonna fish over the ledge. There's a channel for about three metres where it's nice and flat and then it comes up at the bottom of the peg. I don't mind it coming up at the bottom of the peg because my bait will collect in that position and that can become a little bit of a hot spot. Because you can imagine the bait releases out of your ground bait if this is where the peg comes up, the flow's like this, the bait will come along, travel along the bottom and hit this ledge. And that can be a good little spot to catch fish, you know, as well as over where my ground bait is. So that's the tactics. Let's see what happens. Right, so I'm going to prepare my ground bait here for the session on the River Trent today. And I'm going to use my standard mix that I use here in the UK on the rivers, which is two kilos of spotted fin roach and a kilo of spotted fin canal. Both natural ground baits, no fish meal, obviously. Um, this mix is quite sticky, smells of coriander. I've used it for sort of quite a few seasons now and I've caught a lot of fish on it, so I'm very confident on it. Um, obviously, I've got the natural roach, natural in colour as well as a natural ground bait. And one thing I carry separately is a pot of black dye. So, if I mix my ground bait or get to my peg and look at the river and think, oh, it's very clear and I want to darken it off further, I can add some of this black dye to it. And sort of alternatively, like today, it's uh, got a bit of colour in it. I think the fish are going to feed quite confidently. I don't think I need to add any black dye, but I carry a pot. It doesn't wash out of the ground bait in the river on the, on the bottom. It'll stay in it, keep it dark. So that's a good little product to carry with you. I bring some uh, bait sauce which is like a sort of gluggy type liquid, a bit like molasses. I like to add a bit of that to the mix, just added attraction. It will leach out of the ground bait, draw fish in. And then I'm gonna add soil to my ground bait to give it extra weight. So I've got some soil here that I've sprayed up with, with the atomizer to a certain point. I'm gonna spray it a bit further. It's important that the soil has got water in it, that it's not too dry. And it's important that you sort of mix the ground bait on its own first and then add the soil to the ground bait afterwards. One last thing, if, which I learned this this season, if you want to make your ground bait stickier, you can add grey lean to it. Now grey lean, I've used it a lot in the past with soil to make that sticky with, with sort of joker fishing, but I've never used it in the ground bait mix, but I've seen this done this year in Italy, and it's quite a good little tip. If you want to make your ground bait stickier, but you don't necessarily want to change the type of ground bait you're using, to a three kilo mix, you can add a pint or a pint and a half of grey lean, drill it in, and it will make the ground bait bind, but when it hits the bottom, it will still break up nicely. So that's a, something I learned this year, so something you can try.
because of the way the peg plums up and I've got a specific little area I want to fish in quite accurately or very accurately, I've decided to pop my bait rather than throw it. You know, I can throw it accurately, but I want to be 100% sure I'm in the right place. I'm going to be running over, especially if I'm fishing with a flat float. I'm going to fish in a small area of my swim. You know, I'm not looking to run it right down to the bottom of the peg on a long line. I want to concentrate in this area. So I'm going to pop my bait there. I'm going to be putting more ground bait in during the day. And the loose feed really is to draw fish up from, from downstream and to make some noise on top of my ground bait. So it's an attractor. So that's why I'm potting it. And like I say, because there's a bit of a ledge, I have got a specific spot I want to fish in. I've got a marker on the far bank and I'm going to pop my bait downstream of where I'm sitting because I want my rig to trim up and, and be all set when I'm on top of the... top of the ground bait. With the soil in, that ground bait will go straight down. It's not going to sort of move a yard downstream or anything. And I've put hemp and caster in, but not loads because I don't know how it's going to fish. So I just want to build the swim up. So the session's just started, I've cut my bait in and just sort of, well, I haven't had a bite yet, I've only been fishing a few minutes. I don't know if you can see the float that well on the, on the video, but the flow, basically it boils up and it looks rubbish, then it goes smooth and it goes through nicely. So there's little windows where I can present the bait nicely, like now doesn't look too bad. And then there's little moments when it, it, it looks rubbish and I probably won't get a bite. At times the, the flow is kicking out and moving away from me, which is obviously not great because it's taking it away. There's a fish, look. First fish, that's a result. You never know, do you, when it's like this, what's going to happen? Like it to be a roach. It is a roach. First one. First fish in these conditions. It's uh, maybe a sign that we're going to have a good day. So like I was saying, not every run through is going to be the same in, in these conditions. And I just have to be a bit patient like now it's lovely, it's all smooth. Can put it through right over my ground bait. The float's not pushing out into the river. And that looks like a nice run through with a chance of catching a fish. In a minute, it will boil up. My float will start pushing out or riding up. And I just got to go through those little spells and, and It's watercraft, basically. I'm loose feeding hemp and casters, sort of 50-50 ratio. And I'm loose feeding downstream on top of where I've put the ground bait in. to create noise and a column of bait going down a swim, hopefully to draw some fish up. Bit of weed. I think in this coloured water, red maggot should be better than bronze in theory. 
starting off on maggots just to see if I get some bites and then I'll hopefully move on to casters. But we'll have to see what happens. Hopefully that's not the only fish we catch. This type of fishing, it takes a little while just to get sort of your float trimmed up how you want, get, get your depth right. And it's not completely simple with the variation in flow. It's like a perseverance job. See, now I can almost hold it dead still over my ground boat. There you go, Andy. So we've been fishing probably about 50 minutes now. Cupped in nine or 10 balls of ground bait with a bit of hemp and caster and an odd maggot in it. Not lots of bait, just to sort of mark the spot and get the swim going. And then I've been loose feeding hemp and casters bang on top of where I've cupped the ground bait in. And I started on a, one of my floats, a Siwai River which is a bodied float with a wire stem and a plastic tip, two grams. Putting that through and I call, it's been, it's just, it's just sort of slowly getting better basically. I call an odd roach, a perch, mostly down my swim in the little area where it sort of shallows, shelves up, shallows up as it gets down. Then slowly the fish have come up and I've changed to this two gram Hydra round flat float, um, which has the tip and the stem in line, which, make, which makes it easy to fish. Um, and you can put it through half pace. So I've just started fishing this, this flat float. I'm about four inches over depth. I've got a 16 hook 209. It's a 16 Hydra 601. It's quite a small hook. It's not a massive, there you go. Ah, oh, bumped it. Uh, that might have been a perch, that the fish before was a perch. But um, yeah, so I've been loose feeding and I catch a couple of fish, it goes quiet, I put a ball of ground bait in, full of hemp and casters and maggots and a few pinkies, so as much bait as I can get in it. And I just drop a ball in on my spot where I put the initial balls in, obviously. And then I'm just trying to run this flat float over that little area of ground bait because that's now where all the bites are coming, really. So, you know, the loose feeding is just making some noise, hoping, hopefully drawing fish up from downstream because that's obviously not going to hit the bottom until further down the peg. And then what's, what I'm catching over is the ground bait. There's different sort of ways of loose feeding on rivers and different rivers seem to have different styles as in where in your peg you loose feed. So I've sort of the main river I fished coming up, you know, growing up and that is the River Thames. And this is the sort of way you would fish the Thames. You would put your ground bait slightly downstream, probably a little bit more downstream than I have today. And then you loose feed straight on top, top of it because the fish tend to run above your ground bait and you quite often catch above it. On other rivers, um, for example, the River Yare, where I fish a bit, 
the, the sort of regulars on that venue seem to fish loose feed more upstream and try and get the bait falling more in front of them. Um, and they're not worried about the fish going above their loose feed. They, um, they have a different style. So different anglers and, and different rivers have different different sort of uh, tactics loose feeding by. But I'm confident doing it like this. I've had good results on the Trent doing it this way. And, uh, and that's the way I'm confident of loose feeding. Might not be right, might be right, I don't know, but that's what I generally do. Okay, so I'll just run you through my flat float rig. It's not complicated. Basically, I've got a 16 IM601 Hydra hook, which is not a big 16 hook, but in this flow, you can't go too small. I've got 09 fluorocarbon Hydra Nature. Basically, I use the fluorocarbon not because it's invisible, which it supposedly is, it's just a bit stiffer. And in this flow, fishing maggots, you could get your hook length spin up a little bit. So I've gone for fluorocarbon, 20 centimetre hook length. And then I've got one, two, three, four number nine shot, pretty much equally spaced. And then a bulk, which is made up of a non-toxic olivette and some eights underneath, a little string of eights underneath, like a boom, just to stop the sort of rig looping over the top of the olivette and tangling up. And I just prefer that rather than just having a, a, an olivette on its own. And then above the olivette, I've got four little um, stots, number 11 stots. The flat float's got a hollow tip, so the trimming, they're like trimming shot to adjust it. So they don't need to be too small because it's got a hollow tip. Now, one important thing when you're fishing a flat float or a round float on a river is where your bottom shot is and where your olivette is in relation to the to the bottom of the river. So my last number nine, I've actually pulled it up above the not five centimetres, so it's 25 centimetres from the hook. Now if I'm fishing half the hook length over depth, that shot is obviously off the bottom. If I go more over depth than that, that shot is nearer the bottom. And if you're trying, I'm talking about when you're trying to put your float through here, not nailing it dead still, the nearer that shot is to the bottom, the more chance it is of affecting your presentation. It, it can be not so attractive for the fish. So you need to keep that shot away from the bottom of the river. Don't have it too close. The other thing is the distance of the olivet to the bottom. So if that olivet's, I think from the loop to the olivet, I think that's 55 centimetres roughly. Now if that olivet was down here, Again, when you're trying to trot it through, it would make the whole rig sort of catch on the bottom too easily. It would all, all, the, all the weight, all the mass of the, the weight of the, the rig would be too near the bottom. To make it fish properly, you need to keep it up away, away, from, the, away from the bottom. So the more, sort of, the more you're, you're over depth, the higher you need to have your olivet to compensate for that. A little bit hard to explain, but hopefully you get the drift. That's 016 mainline which is like a compromise between being strong enough to take the rigours of striking and, and, and fishing in these sort of conditions, plus gives me the option of putting a thicker hook length on. I'm on 09 because I'm fishing for roach, but if I wanted to go on to 012, 014, if I started catching some bigger fish, I can do that because I've got 016 mainline. The float in this case, like we've mentioned before, is a hydra round flat float with the tip and the stem in line it's got a spring eye and it's got a hollow tip. The hollow tip obviously quite buoyant, which helps in these conditions. And that just runs up to a number six elastic, which is um, through the whole top kit. 
So another thing that I'll just talk about briefly, I'll get that out of the way. When you're flat float fishing or any type of fishing where you're putting the tip of your pole into the water, there's you can have a problem where the water will come into the top kit and you'll strike and there'll be all water in it, it'll make the pole all go all soft and it'll just be horrible. What you need to do is try and seal the top kit and the way to do that is to, down this end, is not have a, a stripper, you know, not have a, a puller bush or whatever in here. If you have got one, it's not a problem. You can just put um, electrician's tape over it to seal it up. But in this case, I've got some top kits without stripper bushes in deliberately for when I fish rivers. And inside here, I've put an EVA Hydra cone, right? So that is a perfect seal. You see that so that there's no way anything's getting past that the air that's in there is staying in there this end obviously i've got a small internal bush i don't know if andy can see that and i've got a silicon float stop you need to get the ones that are soft so that's i threaded that onto my elastic and that goes and butts against the internal bush so as long as the elastic's tensioned reasonably, which it will be when you're fishing a flat float, the, it's hard for the water to get past that silicon float stop. In any case, I've got the EVA foam cone the other end, so the air that's in there can only come out this way. So the water's got to force the air out. And I fished all day today with the tip of the water, un, the tip of the pole under the water a lot of the time, and I've had absolutely no water go inside my pole. So. You know, you can use that on lakes, on rivers, on deep canals, anywhere where you've got your pole in the water. If, you have, if you're getting fed up with, you know, having a top kit that's going like this and there's water spraying out of it, that's what you've got to do. It's worth doing. So that's my rig, as usual, not overly complicated, but a few little gadgets and bits that if you uh, use them will make your life easier. So this is my uh, other rig, my uh, round-bodied float. Same hook, 16 IM601 to 09 fluorocarbon, 20 centimetres. Basically, it's identical. I've got four number nines. I've got my bulk, my Olivet, and my, uh, my shot beneath it, number eights in this case, 55 centimetres from the loop to the Olivet, so quite high up. Uh, main line's 014 on this float, on this rig. And this is my Siwai River model. Now this float is uh, one that I've designed and tested a lot. And I, you know, to be honest, I really like this float. It's great for rivers. It's got quite a long plastic tip in it. So it's reasonably buoyant, but the length is the key. It's got a nice round body and a wire stem. It's a balsa body on this float. And this, this one, you can really edge it through and it doesn't ride up because of the shape. And with the long tip, it's like you can you can just work the float really well. The wire stem, I don't know exactly why it works as well as it does, it's just a combination of factors, but it, it's a really good float for edging it through. It's also a good float to use on commercials in the winter, fishing for silvers, because it's very stable. You know, if you want like a 0.75 or a gram bulk rig, and if it's a windy day and you're going to be fishing on your spray bar, it, it sits really, really nicely. So that rig is combined with a number six elastic, same as the other one. And uh, yeah, just a very, very similar rig really, but different design float and different, this float's more for putting it through and holding it back. And the other float is sort of, I can hold it back harder. That's the difference. Okay, so flat float designs. So there's loads of different flat floats on the market. And uh, there's sort of different reasons for the different designs. So we've sort of simplified it and picked three here. So this is one that most people will recognise, a Creluso. It's, uh, I think it's got a plastic body. So that is a, a flat float that really, for me, is designed for holding dead still with big baits for big fish. That's what I would use that flat float for. So if I was going to come here and bait dropper worms and try and catch some big perch or a barbel or, or bream and I wanted to nail it dead still, put it on the spray bar, hold it there over depth with a bait like a lobworm on a big hook, I would use that type of float. It's not overly sensitive but if you're fishing for big fish that's like, and, and nailing it dead still that's a good choice. 
Now we come on to two Hydra flat floats. So this is like a refined version of the Creluso. You can see it's got a long, finer tip in it. That's actually a fiberglass tip. It's got a wire stem. It's not quite as offset. It's a very slim profile. That, that body is actually made of EVA, so it's like indestructible. You can smack that with a hammer, you can cut into it, it'll never take on water. So that's handy when you're storing them in your, in your stack or wherever. It doesn't matter if it gets slightly squashed, it, it won't affect it. Um, so that float I use quite a lot on the broads. Again, for fishing dead still, because it's got the tip is offset from the, the stem, I use that float for holding dead still for skimmers. And I normally have my last shot, which could be two number 10s or a number nine or a number eight. I'll have that just off the bottom and the float trimmed right down like that. Because quite often I'll actually get lift bites. That's why it's got a long tip. It's a sensitive float. It's designed in Italy for fishing for skimmers, which they do loads of. And uh, so that's a good float for holding still, more sensitive than the Caruso. A uh, good float for skimmer fishing comes in a comes up to uh, I think they go up to 30 grams that float so it comes in lots of sizes and then this is the flat float that I actually use the most in the UK that's called a Hydra blade this is called a Hydra round so this float you can see quite unusually probably for a, a, a flat float the stem is in line with the tip and it runs down the side of the body of the float so what that means is you could actually put that float out in still water and it will sit like that because it's acting almost like a normal pole float. So once you're in the river, you can, you can hold it still. It's not really designed for holding dead still. It's designed for putting it through at various different speeds, whatever you want to use. And then you choose a relevant size float depending on what you're trying to do. But it's a great float for what we've been doing today where we're actually putting the float through but slowing it down obviously because it's slim as all flat floats are it's less resistance making it easy to hold back but because it's all in line you can fish it fishes like a normal float it's a little bit hard to describe also a good thing about this float is it's good if you're a beginner to flat float fishing it's the easiest flat float to use you know normally when you get to your peg you look at the river and you think oh i think i need four grams or i think i need three grams with this float, you've got a bit of a tolerance either way. If you pick a three gram and it's just slightly too heavy, you can still use it because because of the design, because of the, the way the, the tip is in line with the stem. You know, if you use, you know, something I do see actually sometimes, if you use a Creluso and it's too heavy, say that's the surface of the water, you'll see the float sitting with the antenna facing downstream. That's a sign that the float is too heavy. It should fish like this with the antenna horizontal or leaning slightly towards you. Then you know you've got the right size. And that's not easy to do when you're, you know, when you're not used to it and you've got to judge the flow, the depth, everything else. You can get the wrong, wrong size out and if you're a bit lazy, fish with one that's too heavy. With this float, you've got a wider range of speeds of flow that you can cover with one float. That's the way to put it. So it's a good float. If you're new to flat, to flat float fishing, you fancy trying it, that's a really good design to start with. So hopefully that's quite clear. That's three different types of flat float, three different reasons for the designs, and uh, it's a really interesting way of fishing, so it's worth giving a go. We've finished the session. It's been hard but rewarding fishing. Caught lovely, beautiful Trent stamp roach. Had a skimmer. An odd bleak, two or three perch. Been difficult, but I don't know, got to be eight pound there. They're, they're chunky little fish they are. Really enjoyed the session. This venue, Burton, uh, Burton Joyce Roadside, is run by Ashfield Angling Club on a day ticket along the road. So if you want to come down and enjoy the fishing, it's no problem, day tickets on the bank. And I uh, hope you've enjoyed the video, picked up some tips, you know, that's a nice net of fish, I'd say, in these conditions. The river's come up, it's gone down. I think some cold water's gone in. But a brilliant day's fishing. To see more videos like this, go to the channel, Fenland Fishing TV.